reading Gary Snyder's newest volume, This Present Moment, I thought about the future Buddha Maitreya's words in the Mahayana treatise on the sublime continuum, that the mind's nature is without beginning, middle, or end. Though Snyder was busy mapping a cosmos scaled beyond a human vantage point decades before phrases like Anthropocene and Ecopoetics gained common cur currency, his work strikes me as having always been less a matter of firsts and foundations than of locating a sanity of the interim, a middle way in thoughts as well as things. I suspect that many of us here are familiar with the creation myths of Jeffy Ryder reading a berry feast at the Sixth Gallery on the night Allen Ginsberg famously debuted Howell. Snyder was pivotal in bringing about two major transitions in American literature and culture the post-war emergence of a new Amer vanguard American poetic community, and the avant-garde's expansion into a more diffuse countercultural sensibility, committed to reorienting the West around values of ecological sustainability, a respect for non-industrialized societies, and reverence for various wisdom traditions. While the pure products of America in William Carlos Williams' imagination lack traditions to give them character, Principles like the interdependent arising of all discrete things would prove capacious enough to link the poetics of relative measure to both a newly situated internationalism and an attunement to the non-human world extending beyond the literate mind to become a lived practice of the wild. That the mind could and can open beyond discourse, not as a belief or a concept, but as a first-hand experience, had always been the motivation behind Ezra Pound's direct treatment and, dic and Williams' dictum, no ideas but in things. And Snyder, reaching past their influence into the Chinese verse tradition, was foremost in extending that work, breaking the spell of several hundred years of Cartesian hypnosis. Perhaps this helps explain the iridescence we persistently find in Snyder's verse, the carved song of vowel tones and consonants and lines like Sawtooth ranges pulsing, veins on the back of the hand, forked out, bird's foot, alluvium, wash, great dunes rolling, each inch rippled, every grain a wave, that serve to unify upaya and prajna, skillful means and discernment in a clear seeing that directly realizes form to be the gesture of emptiness. Snyder's newest volume turns this feel for the medium to both those rounds of experience that fall clean as well as others, more tough and thready, knotty, full of frass and galleries, gnarly. Inclusive is one word that describes its scope, finding across a diverse array of materials and milieu, North American, African, Asian, European, human and non-human, historical and contemporary, both the ascesis of the wild, its hard days and nights, as well as its praxis, to hang in, work it out, watch for the moment, coiled and gazing. Snyder has been awarded the Pulitzer Prize, the American Book Award, and the Bollingen Award, and is an emeritus member of the English Department faculty at UC Davis. But beyond the contributions these laurels register, he's given something incalculable for over half a century, doing the real work, pitching in as we all figure out how we go on. It's a great honor to be able to welcome him up here tonight. That was a remarkable introduction. <laughs> I, I was really impressed uh, and moved. 
to hear somebody tell me what I should do. <laughs> I say, I wonder if I've really done that. <laughs> no, really, it's it, uh, very, very uh, perceptive. And uh, congratulations uh, to both of us. <laughs> <laughs> the previous poem left me baffled. The uh, 11 sections for Anna made me wonder, you know, is she really that bad? <laughs> or maybe she's a goddess and this is describing uh, how she operates the universe. Uh, it could go one way or the other, you know, or uh, maybe it's just playfulness. That would be nice. Uh, at, at any rate, uh, we've already had a very nice diet of uh, poetic uh, uh, insight this very evening, and I can't add much to it. Uh, I'll do what I can, though. So I'm going to read a few poems from my latest published book of poetry called The Present Moment. This is popping. Uh, and then I'm saving a little time to read a recent, I would like to call it, prose poem uh, that I wrote in Africa 22 years ago. <laughs> about the Victoria Falls in uh, Zimbabwe. <coughs> and I, I no longer am taking uh, poetry so seriously that I try not to make mistakes. Uh, in fact, one of the things I like about my most recent book, The Present Moment, uh, is its imperfection. Uh, it, uh, uh, I think that was in a sense deliberate, and, and in a sense that uh, a certain odd realization uh, that perfection, or the idea of perfection, not perfection, the idea of perfection is a kind of a trap uh, that you have to avoid. So don't mind it if you make errors. Errors are a sign of uh, what? Sign of frailty. <laughs> you think errors are a sign of vanity? Humanity. <laughs> well, I don't want to seem so vain. <laughs> so some selections from this. Anger, cattle, and Achilles. Two of my best friends stopped speaking. One said his wrath was like that of Achilles. The three of us had traveled in the desert, awakened to birdsong and sunshine under ironwoods in a wadi south of the border, up the border. They both were herders, one with cattle and poems, the other with business and books. One almost died in a car crash, but slowly recovered. The other gave up all his friends, took refuge in a city, and studied the nuances of power. One of them I haven't seen in days, in years. I met the other recently in the back of a bar. Musicians playing near the window, and he sweetly told me, Listen to that music. The self we hold so dear will soon be gone. Why was Achilles angry? First question. Patroclus got killed. Patroclus got killed. His friend got killed. No, that wasn't why he was really angry. Okay. Yeah, he didn't like that though. Huh? I heard that. Say it again. Memnon took Briseis. Yes. You got the name of the young lady right too. So there are some classical scholars here. Uh, the, the the beautiful eighteen-year-old woman Briseis, who was his mistress and who lived in the tent with him, 
uh, was taken away by his general, uh, who exercised his superior power to say, I like that girl, I want her in my tent. Achilles could say nothing against that, even though he was Achilles, uh, because that was his superior. And so for a month, uh, he did not come out of his tent. Uh, and he stayed there, really sulking, for a month. And the name of the young woman, uh, who, whose name has never been forgotten in classical literature, is Briseis. Um, that's one point. The other two people in this poem, uh, one of them uh, was a great uh, cowboy poet and the owner and manager of the largest ranch in the United States. Uh, who, uh, died of the car wreck that almost killed him, but finally did die of it. Uh, the second person, uh, I will spare telling you who he was, uh, but uh, at one time uh, he was a major uh, shareholder in IBM. Uh, and he treated uh, uh, the economy like hurting. <laughs> so uh, trying to figure out all of that uh, has occupied uh, a, a part of my last 25 years, these men who were such good friends to me. <coughs> Old New Mexican genetics, I don't know if we call this a poem or not, but it's a document. Uh, in Santa Fe, at the Palace of the Governors, uh, at one time, I think they've taken it in now, uh, there was an 18th century listing of the official genetic possibilities of people who were in New Mexico. Uh, they don't put this out anymore. Uh, but it is instructive to all of us to hear what the divisions that they made in New Mexico then were. Espanol, white. But maybe a Mexican or anyone who has enough money and the right clothes. Indio a Native American person. Mestizo, one Spanish and one Indio parent. Color cobrado, quebrado, broken color. A rare category of three-way or more white African Indian. Mulatto, white African ancestry. Coyote, Indio parent with mestizo parents. Lobo, one Indio plus one African parent. And then another category, which is not genetic, but it's a, a good term, is Genizaro, spelled G-E-N-I-Z-A-R-O, which is a um, Spanish pronunciation of the Turkish word janissary. A Plains Indian captive sold and used as a slave. These were the official categories of the 18th century. And another little document that, that I, I want to share with you here is called polyandry. Uh, as you all know, polyandry, uh, uh, as uh, contrasted to polygyny, is the uh, uh, marriage form in which one woman has several husbands. Polyandry is established uh, in some cultures uh, over some centuries, and at one time was much more common than it is now. Uh, the most uh, uh, common polyandry left in the world now is in Kerala, south uh, west India, the, the uh, province of southwest India of Kerala, which is also one of the most um, um, economically viable uh, places in all of India, uh, on, on many levels, both industry and fishing. And the uh, caste, uh, and a caste is almost like a tribal name nowadays, of Nyers, the Nyer caste, 
numbers about 25 million people, they're all polyandrous. But a lot of other castes uh, are and were polyandrous. And so these uh, are the, uh, and, and castes uh, in India, in South India in particular, uh, are, uh, were and are often occupational. Uh, so that uh, uh, earlier metalworking castes now are automobile repair shops. <laughs> Same cast. The following castes practice polyandry. Niners, Dandanes, and Tiyas. Kamalane, such as goldsmiths, blacksmiths, carpenters, laterite cutters, bell metal smiths, and braziers. Also the castes allied to those of the Kolkaru, <coughs> shampoers, masseurs, leather shield workers, bow makers, leather workers, astrologers, washermen, barbers, exorcists, umbrella makers, herbalists, and snake worship songsters. <laughs> All follow patrilineal Petrolini, the name descends in the male line, but the Nairs. The Nairs are Vanumakatyam, flower of followers of the mother lineage. The name passes from the mother to the child, from one end of Kerala to the other. Other possibilities out there, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if there's any connection with this or not, but uh, an, another fact that just is an interesting fact, uh, that um, Kerala, of all the states of India, was the state in which the Communist Party had the most membership, and still is. And of course, as, as many of you probably know already, uh, co uh, Communist Party membership in most of India uh, is primarily among Brahmin caste people, top caste people, uh, who being educated intellectuals think this is the right thing to do. Or at least that was true 30 years ago when I was in India. Last. Most of the Indians of the Pacific Northwest, uh, Klingit, Simshin, Kaiga, and so forth, uh, were matrilineal uh, and semi patrilineal uh, semi uh, polyandrous. Here's a poem called Starting the Spring Garden and Thinking of Thomas Jefferson. <coughs> Turning this cloddish soil still damp and cold, with a heavy curved crofter's spade. Finally, I've read a life of Thomas Jefferson. Here we are, about the same age, 80. Except I'm living alone with my dog and spading a tiny spring garden. And he had hundreds of workers on the farm and fixing the house while he mostly wrote letters and thinking, thinking. True democracy is to help everyone do it for themselves, which means we must think with the help of the whole. Neighborhood bullshit detectors in place, but cleanly and clearly forgiving. To be free is to get past too much lonely, stubborn, deluded, private thirst for what? For things? For some small perk? So give and take. Where was Jefferson in this, I wonder? Whacking clods, tossing clumps of winter grass shoots to the side, scooping out and healing in some Asian aubergine, the kind that you grill with grated ginger. <laughs> the skinny Asian aubergine is the Japanese eggplant, far superior to the big fat Armenian eggplant. <laughs> Uh, that uh, is generally sold in grocery stores. If you want to know how to eat eggplants, get the Japanese eggplants. Long and skinny, slice them in half, 
Grate some fresh ginger, toast them on a grill, and have them with beer in summer. They're perfect. <laughs> Aubergine, I don't like the word eggplant. <laughs> Aubergine is the French word, but it actually comes from Spanish. And the Spanish got it from Arabic, so that means it's, uh, it's got an international history to it. Where was I? <laughs> Everyone free to decide to join in on the work and the play, in part to be free of me, in a world which both has and has not hierarchy. But he had slaves and never thought that through. And Tom had friends like Madison and Adams to honestly argue him down and explain the cracks in his dream. Now, out on the far west coast of the continent, this rough, tough mountain pine tree land, 200 years later, putting another turn on whatever he thought we could do, Tom Jefferson, never too late, never be through. You can always put down your hoe, let your people go. <laughs> I was so serious about this reading that I actually blocked it out. I didn't want to just roam around uh, loosely selecting poems for some, you know, unclear reason. Uh, two short poems. From the sky. The Sandy Hill Cranes are leaving. Soundings from the sky. Songbirds from Central America begin to arrive. Flitting through the bushes, snow patches on the ground, truck still in four-wheel drive. That's March. Yeah. You all hear the snow? Do you all hear the sandhill cranes here when they come over? I don't know quite exactly where they always are. They always cross directly over my place. Pardon me? The Delta. Yeah, they're, I know they come down out in the Delta. They, they cross over where we live in southwestern Nevada County. I tracked it. I, I actually, I drew a line on a map with a string between the Mount Hero Wildlife Refuge uh, and the uh, Kosumnes Refuge uh, down in the valley. Uh, on the Kasumnas River, uh, and Staten Island, which is really, it is an island, but you wouldn't want to call it an island. Uh, it's where they grow a lot of corn, and then they leave the corn for the uh, sandhill cranes uh, to, uh, in, uh, on the ground, whatever is lost on the ground. The sandhill cranes pile up there in the wintertime, and, uh, you know, they just have a wonderful time eating all this. The uh, uh, maize, is, it's maize corn that is left for them. Uh, so I do know they pass directly over our area. Uh, you can hear them when you can't see them. Uh, many, many as a day. Uh, recently, just just recently, I was able to hear them about two weeks ago. Uh, many as a day, you can hear them and look up in the sky for as long as you look, and you cannot pick out anything. Uh, but once in a while, you can see the little specks of V's far up there, uh, working their way going south in the fall or going north in the spring. They are still doing that. And their stopping point, uh, their first stopping point from uh, uh, the Kasumas River, uh, Walnut Creek area, which is a huge sandhill crane stopping point for the winter, their first big stopping point north of that is, Mal is the Malheur Wildlife Refuge at the south end of Malheur Lake. The Malheur Wildlife Refuge is where those dolts from Nevada moved in and thought they were going to sort of take over public land and they moved into the Malheur, Refu the Malheur Wildlife Refuge buildings 
uh, which I had been to, Ursula Le Guin, and I did a, 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 a whole series of, of workshops there one summer, 20 years ago. It's a marvelous place, and it has it is there for the specific purpose of making sure that there is some food, some feed, for the sandhill cranes, both spring and fall. So they plant about 40 acres of grain uh, uh, in the uh, 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 arable lands just south of, of Lake Mount here. The Fish and Wildlife Service plants and harvests and leaves available about 40 acres of grain so that the sandhill cranes, when they're going north and when they're going south, uh, can st uh, feed up again and make that last run. Do these guys know that? Do they know why they're there? No, they don't know why they're there. It's really pitiful. The failure of a, a certain kind of understanding in this country, especially about public land. So a smart young uh, newswoman from the Washington Post was out there uh, and uh, was interviewing people. And then she said right on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the radio, she said, well, I just don't understand why there is so much public land in the West and uh, nobody's owned it anyway. <laughs> You know, so she was falling for uh, the right-wing Republican rancher line. Well, why do you suppose there are very few people in the, on the public land of the West? The answer is, there's no water. Uh, almost none of that land has water, and if it does have water, it's because the uh, Bureau of Land Management has dug some wells and put in some, some canals or uh, ditches uh, for which you might be asked pay a small fee, which would be a lot less than you would want to pay in taxes if you owned it. So the Sierra Club got that wrong too in one of their magazine articles, and uh, somebody described uh, a public land, a BLM land that is, uh, as uh, federal land. It's not federal land. It belongs to the public. It belongs to us. Uh, and it is a managed uh, uh, in trust for the public of the United States and is subject to discussion and uh, uh, input always before making any decisions. Uh, the trouble is the, uh, the American public kind of lets that slide and uh, people do not get out and testify as much as they could or should perhaps about how the, how the uh, public lands are managed. 80% uh, of Nevada is public land. 40%, 40% of California is public land. And 40% of Oregon, Utah, Arizona uh, are all public land as well. Uh, and, uh, in, and in this case, what I'm talking about is Bureau of Land Management, BLM land. Not national forest land. Uh, and not national parks. Uh, I, and I must say, I get kind of annoyed by all the attention that is paid to the national parks uh, when nobody is, seems to be aware and they don't put it on television. And some of the best wilderness areas in the United States are really in the national forests, uh, uh, like the big Bob Marshall wilderness uh, up in uh, uh, Montana. Uh, and then the Bureau of Land Management, the BLM, the only thing the BLM doesn't have is loggable forests. Uh, everything else is all there. Great grazing lands. They used to be the great, but was called the grazing service. Uh, so one of the things that we have to look forward to uh, in the future in this country is being engaged in the, actually engaged more in the lands that we actually have a responsibility for uh, and can, you know, certainly make great use of. And if you want to go out and camp on BLM land, you can, and you can camp for two weeks before they say, you ought to move. <laughs> so you move 10 feet. <laughs> no. All right. Another short point. In the dark, the new moon long set, a soft grumble in the breeze is the sound of a jet so high it's already long gone. And some planet 
rising from the east, shines through the trees. It's been years since I thought, why are we here? <laughs> a funny thing about that poem is that I just heard from a friend in New York that's on the New York subway now. <laughs> The women share in the kill. The women are first at the kill. The women kill the kill. Three straight vertical lines tattooed on the shaved, plucked months. Pass through, go past life, past death. That's Kalahari Desert Bushman. Uh, and there's a book about that by a young woman anthropologist uh, that came out a few years ago called Women Like Meat. <laughs> it's about Kalahari women <laughs> and what they want when they're pregnant. <laughs> Muchi's Persimmons. A uh, 14th century Zen priest in China named, monk's name was Mu Qi, his uh, other name, his painter name is Fa Chang. Uh, famous painter for his own uh, specific territories, which was, he was famous as a painter of dragons, actually, and there are several large dragons in some of the temples of Kyoto yeah, that were uh, printed by, uh, uh, that were uh, painted by Mu Qi. Uh, he also did a number of small, uh, what you would call botanicals, uh, vegetables. And one of them is his uh, little uh, painting of six persimmons, which you probably, if you've read any books on these matters, have seen reproduced in a book, and, and certainly reproduced in a Chinese art book. He was Chinese, but uh, very much favored by uh, uh, Japanese collectors. At the time, right at the time, before the final, uh, uh, the final invasion of the Mongols down into South China when they took over finally the rest of China, Hangzhou, and the southern dynasties. Uh, at that time, the Japanese were trading their beautiful, exquisite swords for beautiful, exquisite Chinese Zen paintings. And the paintings ended up in the uh, temples of Kyoto, where they are now, and I don't know where the swords are. <laughs> Muchi's persimmons. On a back wall down the hall, lit by a side glass door, is the scroll of Muchi's great sumi painting, persimmons. The wind waits hanging from the axles holding still. The best in the world, I say, of persimmons. Perfect statement of emptiness, no other than form. The twig and the stalk still on, the way they sell them in the market even now. The original is in Kyoto, at a lovely Rinzai temple where they show it once a year. This one, is a perfect copy from Benrido. I chose the mounting elements myself with the advice of the monitor. I hang it every fall. And now to these overripe persimmons from Mike and Barbara's orchard. Napkin in hand, I bend over the sink, <laughs> suck the sweet orange goop. That's how I like it. <laughs> Ripping a little twig, these painted persimmons sure cure hunger. <laughs> and then a little quote from uh, uh, the Buddhist philosopher Dogen. There is no remedy for satisfying hunger than a painted rice cake. <laughs>
So we've had lots of wildfires in California the last few summers. Uh, probably there's nothing special about that. Um, we have to assume that there have been wildfires for as long as there have been forests and as long as there's been lightning. Uh, so, you know, coming to terms with that, it took me a long time to come to terms with it because at one time in my life I was on a fire lookout uh, up in northern Washington, northern Washington, just under the Canadian border, looking for lightning strikes and looking for fires all summer. Uh, first summer I was on a lookout, I never got a single fire. <laughs> Wildfire news. For millions, for hundreds of millions of years, there were fires. Fire after fire. Fire raging forests or jungles and giant lizards dashing away or big necks sticking up from the sea looking out at the land in surprise. Fire after fire. Lightning strikes by the thousands, just like today. Volcanoes erupting, fire flowing over the land. Huge sequoia, two foot thick fireproof bark. And flocks of fire pines. Their cones love the heat, only open after fire. How long to say? That's how they covered the continents. 10,000 millennia or more. I have to slow down my mind. <laughs> slow down my mind. Rome was built in a day. <laughs> well, now I'm going to do the other part, which is the uh, sort of prose poem. into another part of the world entirely. Uh, Victoria Falls and Zimbabwe. In 1993, my elder son was uh, contracted with the World Wildlife Fund to do GIS mapping of elephant habitat in Zambia. In time, he continued this work into Botswana and Zimbabwe. Spring of 1994, my younger son Gen and I decided to visit him. We found ourselves in the northerly town of Maun in Botswana. Maun is, the, is at the edge of a big marsh, a network of marshes and waterways uh, called the Okavango, which is uh, fed by the Chobe River. It hosts a huge population of African wildlife, including what is probably the largest herd of wild, free-ranging elephants left in the world. Kai, my older son, borrowed an elderly Toyota Land Cruiser, and with very little gear and rudimentary maps, we set out on the dirt tracks of the Okavango. After surviving that, we packed up our gear hitchhiked into Zimbabwe to the town of Victoria Falls. This is right at the edge of the Zambezi River, which is the northern boundary of Zimbabwe and Botswana. South of the Zambezi, it is southern Africa, and with the nation of South Africa at the very bottom of that. Victoria Falls, in the days when uh, Zim uh, Zimbabwe was called Rhodesia, and the Brits ran the show, yeah, there was a very classy tourist town with an elegant Victorian hotel. Today it is cosmopolitan and very run down. Young European backpackers with their heads sheared to avoid lice um, say that they make it feel a little like Kathmandu. One of the marvels of the world the sublime Victoria Falls is just a bit down the hill. In the local language, it is known as Monsiwatunya, smoke that thunders. It's hardly an exaggeration. It blew me away. 
I walk back down the half mile or so around Victoria Falls, decide it's not finished yet. I didn't stay long enough. I need another trip to this place. So I went down again. It spills into a narrow channel that runs at right angles to the direction of the, of the falls flow. It hits a trough and cuts south, cuts a sharp north to a great turmoil. Finally makes a complete sharp bend, turns south again, and from the map, I couldn't see it all on foot. I see it makes another sharp U-bend, turns north. After a few more turns and curves, it becomes at last a channel and it flows on, on toward the Indian Ocean. One walks from the south end out along the first tongue of tableland opposite the falls, so you can look right across at falling water, only a hundred feet from you the whole way. As one goes farther out, the cool, moist air wells up in one's face, misting through the increasing thicker canopy and undergrowth, and then as you step out at a viewing point, you get hit by a blast of cloud and spray and a sight of a perpetual rainbow. There's a first one great cataract coming down, then north a little, a kind of island puts out with some falls dripping behind, that this island has a forest on it with cliffs and water on all sides, and then another broad stretch of falls with a great flow first and then a thinner flow over a rocky jumble and then an increased flow again and another small point of dry land and then another very long arc of breaking water going directly over it all and down. I make my way point by point out to the far end taking my shirt off putting it in my pack as I get drenched now and the few other tourists walking out this far black and white alike are also drenched. Two white girls in high thigh bathing suits looking totally un-African in this semi-nudity and sexiness, but I know they'll put clothes back on uh, again as soon as they get back toward the entrance. And finally, I'm approaching the last point where the rising water of the falls is falling in a heavy drenching rain back down on us. The path is awash with a constant flow of inch-deep water flooding back out sideways and over the edge. The grass here is a marsh, and the rocks are covered with moss. The drenching downpour comes in pulses, as do the waves of mist coming up. I find myself standing in a cloud of spray in shades of the penitential warrior priest Mongaku chanting the Fudo mantra during the, during the Yamabushi waterfall practice that he did, hands in Gasho, standing straight in the cold downpour of a waterfall, eyes closed, closed, meditating in the midst of the downpour for days and days because of the woman he killed, the meeting of ceaseless flow and stubborn stiffness, and the energy package, all this represents volcanism, tectonics, subduction, subduction of the whole globe, the planetary heat engine that makes the cycles of weather and water. Finally, sopping, I'm looking over the edge at the very far point of this, half off the cliff, one hand on a boulder, I can see straight down into the whirling, frothing channel below. And I recall my Yamabushi teacher saying as he hung me over the cliffs of Mount Omine, just tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Reticulate foam shows up in a thick shaft of sunlight between the mist, huge raindrops falling, while between and through the raindrops, the mist is rising all at the same time. The great natural magic of the planet. And walk back beyond the reach of the heavy rains. Only a few hundred yards away, it gets drier. Take off my canvas shorts and wring them out. 
then walked slowly back up the trail again, listening to the roar, touching from time to time on mist. As I walked back toward the gate, note the gradual change in vegetation away from the almost cloud forest that has formed along the lip where the spray rises from the falls. The air of crackly dry leaves of the ground, trees and branches, red leaf thick and acacia galpinii with big vines in it. By the time I get to the gate, my chest has already dried off. My hair is half dry. I put my t-shirt back on, wet shorts and dry t-shirt, little date bag, and walk by up the trail, taking the Victoria Falls Hotel branch, a trail spattered by elephant droppings. Go back to the back side of the elegant old colonial Victoria Falls Hotel. Broad clipped lawn, starched waiters, the patio laid out for tea or dinner. Pass right through the lobby and the reception room in a decor of white and light green. Go down the steps to the limousine stop, down the gated doorway of the hotel to the broad half dirt main street that runs between town proper and the waterfall. Head out for our tent site in the public camping ground. A continuous stream of variously dressed black people walking, walking everywhere. The one thing I have to say is not an exaggeration about that, uh, is that uh, very large raindrops falling while mist rises between the raindrops simultaneously. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Final little point, by the Chobe River. The Chobe is the river that uh, supplies water to the Okavango Marsh in Botswana. <laughs> the new moon crescent settles in a lavender dusk. An elephant shadow slides beyond the trees. Bathing by a faucet with a bucket, sitting on a shattered concrete block, the old land cruiser engine cooling, just before hyenas come. Mm. Thank you all. So it's kind of, walk, kind of weird to be back at Berkeley after all these years <laughs> and uh, seeing that they're going to take that lovely old museum down and blow it up or something. <laughs> Just when I thought it was new. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Hey, that was a lot. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Elliot. That was the uh, last reading in the Holloway series for the fall of, the, of this year. Next semester, come back. Uh, poets visiting will be Douglas Kearney, Graham Faust, Morgan Parker, and Simone White. I'm looking at my watch. We need to spirit Gary away because of the set in stone reservations for dinner downtown. <laughs> this has been a transformative evening. Thank you all for coming. Remember you were here. Thank you.